exciting, innovative, refreshing, life-giving church. The mission of Storyline Church is simple. We will connect everyday stories to the story of Jesus. We are not defined by our color, our creed, or our background, but we're defined by a passion for God and for people.
Good morning and welcome to Storyline. We are so glad that you're able to join us today as we continue in our sermon series, Jesus the Rabbi of Nazareth. If today is your first or maybe it's your second time viewing, thank you so much for joining. And there's actually a link to a connect card in the comments below um, that we would love for you to fill out so that we can connect with you, be able to hear your story, and just give you a personal thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, every day in my life, and I'm sure in your life as well, um, there are these moments where questions kind of may come up in your mind. And maybe um, the question comes up in a moment when you just got off the phone and it was an unexpected phone call and you received news that you weren't wanting, weren't expecting to hear. And the question may be like, man, what, where am I going to get the strength to go through this? Like, how am I going to get through this? Um, or maybe the moment comes when you turn on the news or you open social media and you just see all the unrest and you think, man, where is our hope for our world? Where is our peace? Or maybe it comes in a beautiful moment that you share with friends or family or loved ones and you think, man, why, why am I so happy? Like, where does this joy come from? And the answer to all of these questions and so many more to all the joy and the laughter, to the tears and the sorrow, um, the hopelessness, the answer to all of it is Jesus. His name is above so much more than any other name. We can have hope because of him. We have joy because of him. We can have peace because of him. And in Psalm 23, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so today, as we continue to sing these songs, I want to encourage you to remind yourself that there is an answer for wherever you find yourself today, wherever you find yourself in this moment, in this season, whether it is joy or sorrow, peace or unrest, whatever you're looking for, whatever you're hoping for, there is an answer and his name is Jesus. And so we can lift our voices, we can be encouraged and not be distracted by what is going on around us because he's already there in the midst of it, in the midst of everything that is going on and he's already conquered it and we can praise him for that. So let's sing these next few songs together. Love has a name, Jesus. 
Jesus. Love has a name. Love has a name. Jesus. There's a joy that triumphs over fear. There's a laughter that wipes away all tears. There's a presence that changes atmospheres. There's a name. We will fix our eyes on the one who overcame. Oh, it 
chases me down, fights to I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I was your foe, still you love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no word, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so for your love and for your hope and for your peace and for all the things that you are and that all of our answers, all of our strength, all of our peace, all of our joy, all of it is found in you. And I thank you so much for that truth and that for all that you are 
and that we can rest in you in all of our uncertainty and all of our um, joy in every moment that we find ourselves in. Um, you are in that moment and you are enough for that moment. And God, I pray that you be with the rest of this time that we have together, Lord. Um, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Storyline. My name is Chelsea. And I'm Joseph. We're so glad that you could join us this Sunday. We want to say happy 4th of July weekend to everybody and we hope everyone had a wonderful day yesterday. If this is your first time joining us online for church, we want to say welcome and we would love to get to know you better. And the best way for us to do that is for you to fill out the connect card in the comment section below. Just let us know it's your first time. We'd like to be able to pray for you and send you a gift in the mail for being a first time attender. So there's a new life group out and this life group is called the Alpha Life Group. So in the Alpha Life Group, it's a safe space for those who want to learn more about God, want to learn more about the church, about the Bible, etc, etc. This is a place where you can come and there's no bad question. Um, sign up online, use a connect card, sign up, go in an Alpha Group. I'll be honest, in my first couple years in Christianity, I didn't know what was up from down. I mean, granted, it's, 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 it's a big book, it's a best-selling book, but Everything in it is like it's just it's, it's it's all over the place. So this Alpha Life group will help you get dialed in, help you learn more about the Bible, Jesus, God, church, all of that. So please sign up in the Connect Card Alpha Life group. So this Sunday we're continuing our series called Jesus the Rabbi from Nazareth. We're on week four. We're going to send it off to Pastor Akeem. But if you've missed weeks one through three, you've missed a powerful word. But don't worry, you can find that on YouTube. Go ahead, you can find it through our website. But now we pass it off to Pastor Akeem for week four of Jesus the Rabbi from Nazareth. See I remember growing up in Las Vegas and uh, my mother moved from Belize to Las Vegas and I remember her getting a job at the Bellagio. If you've ever been to Vegas or heard about Vegas, you know where the Bellagio is, right? So she was working at the Bellagio for housekeeping and uh, years go by, she'd be just uh, consistent and faithful as an employee there and then she would move her way up to supervisor of housekeeping which was kind of a big deal for her and so uh, oftentimes though uh, mom would come home and she would tell me about the people that she would get to meet at the Bellagio that was staying at a guest at, at her a casino and so she would come home and she would tell me that she would meet all these different people and I'm like what you met you met Magic Johnson and you didn't know who he was and so she would meet all these amazing people and so when she would come home sometimes she'd work overtime and so when she worked overtime that meant that she was coming home with something good either it was like big tips or it was like uh, somebody that she a picture of somebody that she met or something else and so every time she would come home she'd work overtime I'd be at the door ready ready for her to get home because I'm gonna get, ask her hey what did you what did you get what did you meet who did you meet and so she would come home and uh, I said okay, okay mom I'm glad you're here glad you're here but that's great but who did you meet what, what do I get how do I get did you bring anything home for me right and oftentimes she would say no I just brought me right and oftentimes I tell you that story because in our relationship with Jesus oftentimes early on in our faith that's kind of what we do right it's like God we're so thankful for you okay okay great let's get that out of the way okay what did you what did you bring how do I get it right what did you give me what did you bring for me and oftentimes that's how we look at our relationship with Jesus and uh, John though tells us that is it is impossible you see this in a little bit it is impossible to have an authentic relationship with somebody you're trying to get something from right it's impossible, right? It's impossible. Maybe you've even discovered this in your relationship with your marriage or uh, 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 in your uh, friendships with your kids or with your coworkers, right? It's impossible to get something, to have an authentic relationship with somebody you're always trying to get something from because there's an agenda. There's this, you know, maybe we've all been in those conversations. You're trying to talk with somebody, chit chat, be like, okay, we just get that away. Let's get to my point, right? Because there's an agenda. It's impossible. And so John tells us that God gave us everything he need, that we needed and everything he wanted us to have when he gave us all himself, right? He gave it all to us, everything we needed and everything we wanted all at once when he gave us himself. So when God showed up, when God touched down, Jesus touched down on this planet earth, right? Um, you would find that God gave us everything. And when you understand that this idea of God showing up because he loves you and he loves me, when you understand, when that translates from your head to your heart, it changes everything, right? You, you, you understand what, what Paul understood. 
a peace that transcends all understanding, right? That transcends everything when, uh, uh, when pain and meaningless uh, problems and situations encounter your life, you understand that there's this peace that transcends everything. And John in his journey with Jesus tells us, look, I follow Jesus. I subscribed, right? I friended Jesus. I became a follower of Jesus because not what I could get for him, but because of what I saw and what I heard. And as a result of that, I put my faith in Jesus, not because of faith, but because of what I saw and heard. And we're in part four of this journey with John is the journey with Jesus. And what John would tell us after these signs, right? These events that took place that pointed to these signs and these signs served as evidence of who Jesus claimed him to be. And as a result, I put my faith in him. John says, John says, because of that, I am writing to you. I'm documenting my experience for you. So that not that just you would know what Jesus did, but that you would know who Jesus is. And here's John telling us his experience. And today we're looking at the fourth sign, probably the most popular uh, uh, sign that Jesus has ever experienced um, with his journey with John. And uh, Jesus is traveling down Jerusalem with his disciples and John the Baptist, not the guy that's writing this, John the Baptist, Jesus's cousin, was actually beheaded. And uh, Jesus decides to go to a remote place kind of like this, a remote place by himself. That was probably a good move from him. His cousin was just beheaded. He wants to kind of clear the air, get away for a little bit. Maybe he went to grieve, right? So Jesus goes away to this remote place, but in his silent retreat, it's interrupted by a crowd because wherever Jesus go, there's always a crowd to follow him. And they interrupt his silent retreat. And this is kind of where the story picks up in John's journey with Jesus. It says this, And a great crowd of people followed him. Always a crowd. Because, because of what? Because of faith? No, no. Because nobody ever followed Jesus in the first century because of faith. No, it says a great crowd followed uh, him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. In other words, what they saw, what they heard is why they followed What John saw and what John heard is ultimately why John believed. So imagine this. Here's Jesus getting away from the crowd with his disciples, kind of like this. And they go to this mountainside uh, with his disciples and they get away from the crowd. And uh, he gets there and uh, all these thousands of people are kind of in the distance. They're coming towards Jesus and he's trying to get away from them. And he's at this mountainside and uh, they hear about him. A lot of them haven't heard about him. They haven't seen him. And so they're kind of uh, I hear that he's in here, that they're in his region, in his area. And so he's trying to get away from them. And so he, they're coming to him. Why? Because they want to hear about this wannabe Messiah, this, this, this maybe prophet, this miracle worker from God. And if anything, they might get uh, uh, something from him. They might see somebody in their family and their friends healed, right? They might see even a magic trick performed by Jesus. And so they come and here's Jesus. The crowd's in the distance and he's at the mountainside. And the scripture says this, then Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down. You just want to do that. Everyone want to get away, just sit down, right? That's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. And it says the Jewish Passover festival was near. Now it tells us this because it tells us uh, what the crowd response was a little bit later in the story, you'll see. But as you probably know, you've probably heard of it before, the Passover was this celebration, a celebration that, Jew, that, that Jewish people would celebrate of God using Moses, this prophet, to deliver uh, Jewish people out of Egypt, out of slavery, Right, And so every time this Passover took place, it was an annual reminder of the Jewish people that God used this Moses, this prophet, to deliver them out of, uh, out of Egypt. And so uh, this was uh, big for them. This was a reminder for them that, hey, Moses delivered them. It was a, a reminder of another Moses to come. Someone else will deliver us from this oppression that we're in under Rome. And so John goes on, he says, when Jesus looked up, and saw a great crowd coming toward him. Okay, so you got the picture. He's sitting down. He looks up. He's like, oh my God, really? His disciples look up. They're like, okay, really? Here they are. They're coming towards him. And they're kind of like us, right? They want something from him. Right? They want something from him. And they're so enamored with the signs that they miss the point of the signs. They're so enamored with the signs that they... They weren't concerned about the person. They wanted another magic trick, right? They wanted another story, something, event that they could go back home and talk about. And so John says, he said to Philip, so here's the disciples sitting down on the side and the people are coming in the distance. 
And so Jesus says to Philip, one of the disciples, he says, hey, Philip, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? Philip looks up and he says, looks at the crowd. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, what do you mean to feed these people? Look, Jesus, we don't feed people. We heal people. And when I, when I say we, I mean we as in you, right? You heal people. Jesus is like, no, no, come on, come on, Philip, 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 come on. Philip, you're from this region. You grew up around here, right? Come on. Where's the best restaurant, okay, to take all these people to feed? Where, where can we cater something and to feed all these hundreds and thousands of people that are coming in? And where is, is it? Is it Gott's? Right? Is it is it Zachary's Pizza? Right? Where is it is it is it, is it a, a In and Out Burger? Is it Chick Fil A? Where is the best place to cater in food to feed all these people? And he says this because John says it was only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. And here is Philip's response. Ready? He says, "It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite." In other words, nowhere, Jesus, there's not a restaurant in sight. There's no one you can cater in, a team to bring in to feed all these people. Come on. And Philip was right because Philip was from this area. He knew like, man, there's nothing around here to take care of all these people. And so uh, one of the disciples, uh, it says this, Andrew, Simon's Peter, Simon's Peter brother spoke up. And it, this, for me, when he spoke up, it was kind of a, it was, it was sarcasm. It was a joke right? He speaks up and he finds this little boy who had lunch, you know, he's like, hey, um, hey, can I take, he tried to steal his lunch. That's my perspective. He tried to steal his lunch. And I was like, no, no, I'm gonna give you my lunch. This is all I have. And the little boy's like, no, no, no. He's like, come on, come on. You want to meet Jesus? He was trying to take this boy's lunch, right? And so he goes to him and he, and, he, and this is what uh, Andrew speaks up and he says, it's sarcasm. He says, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. It's probably pickle fish, right? It's a poor man's lunch. And everybody's looking at Andrew like, are you serious? Like that his lunch is going to feed all these people? Like, come on. Okay. Jesus, okay, okay, okay. Okay, now we get all the bad ideas out. He says, okay, sit down all the people on the grass because there's plenty of grass, it says. And they sat down. And then John tells us this detail that's really important. He says, there was about 5,000 men were there. Okay, he, he says men, but he means that there's not just men, okay? He, he, he counted women as well. Um, but he says there's 5,000 men were there. He didn't, he, he appreciated women, of course. I mean, there's children there, there, there are uh, 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 women there as well. Um, so he says there's 5,000 men there. And the reason why he says 5,000 men, because 5,000 men was equivalent to a, a, a fully formed Roman legion. So John is doing some foreshadowing here from what's about to happen, okay? Um, so uh, people say it's estimated to be about 20,000 people that are here right now. And so the story goes on and John says, Jesus then took the loaves and he gave thanks. I'm reading the story and maybe you're, you're following along. I'm, th I'm thinking, maybe you're thinking like, I'm thinking like, he takes the, lo the, the, the bread and he's like, all right, everybody by your head. Like, how are you going to do this? How are you going to feed all these people? Like, I would buy my head with like one eye open, like this is not gonna happen. It would be like if I walked into the movie theater where we have church and I brought a bagel and I was like, hey, I got a bagel. I got a, I got a bagel for all of us to have breakfast, right? That's not gonna happen, right? You would look at me like you're crazy. What you're probably thinking, no, no, there'd be some people, cool people out with some, with some cool shirts. They're gonna pass out some bagels. No, 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 no. I got a bagel, a bagel for all of us to eat. That wouldn't work. And so they're all like, how is this gonna happen, Jesus? And Jesus breaks the bread and he gives it to his disciples to distribute it. And it says, those who were seated as much as they wanted. So in other words, people ate and others got seconds. Okay, not just seconds, others probably got thirds, okay? And it says, and he did the same with the fish. So there was plenty and everybody ate. And it says, when they all had enough to eat, he said this to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. Now, there's kind of stories about why people say this, this isn't a miracle, this doesn't actually happen, and they try to discredit this, this whole story, um, that hey, it doesn't actually happen. What actually happened was, was, was everybody was there, they all had lunch, but they weren't sharing, but the little boy started to share their lunch, and when he, he shared their lunch, everybody shared their lunch, and as a result, everybody ate. Maybe, but that's not what anybody who said that was actually there said what happened. So we're just going to go with the people who were actually there. And John said, no, 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 this was a sign. Okay. And everybody that were there, they didn't know initially, but they knew eventually that all these people, wait, 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 
All these people are like, wait, hold on. Okay, there's so many people here and everybody is eating, right? They didn't know initially, but they found out eventually like, whoa, 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 whoa. It was, we're a group of people, a large, a lot of people were coming and we saw 12 guys in the distance. Not five guys, not five guys. We saw 12 guys in the, in the distance. And as a result of that, now we're all sitting here and we're all eating bread and fish. How is this happening? There's not a wagon. There's not a food truck in sight. There's not a catering team here. And we're all eating. So they gather them all these 12 baskets that were left over because they had plenty enough to eat. Now, these are Jewish people. And this is really important because they're kind of putting two and two together, right? They realize, okay, wait. When we were with, when our ancestors were with Moses in the wilderness, right? They, they ate, but they only had enough to eat, barely enough. But this guy, this rabbi, we've ate so much. Like, I mean, I've had two plates. I mean, you, he's had five plates. He's had five plates. I mean, we have enough and we have leftovers for who knows how many days. So our ancestors with Moses, they had enough. But this guy, this rabbi, we have plenty And what they're probably thinking, and at least what they should be thinking, perhaps what you should be thinking, is who is this man? Who is this rabbi? Who is this guy from Nazareth? So after the people saw these signs performed, and this is why we know that this is what they were thinking, because it says after the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is a prophet who is coming to the world, right? And for a moment, watch this. And for a moment, just for a moment, they shifted their focus from a sign to a person. They shifted their focus from a sign to a person. And it was only for a moment because we see that they get hungry again later. But for a moment, they shifted their mind from off of their appetite, from off of themselves. And they pointed towards the one who the sign was pointing to. They thought, oh my gosh, this is who Moses was talking about. The other prophet that would come and deliver us. This is what Daniel, this is what all the other prophets were pointing to. This guy, this prophet, this is it. This is the guy that they were all talking about. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, he withdrew himself. And this is what all the foreshadowing was about. Suddenly, right? They thought, Moses, if this prophet Moses can deliver us out of Egypt, certainly this rabbi from Nazareth or wherever he's from, this rabbi can deliver us out of the oppression and the hand of this government, this Roman government, right? Imagine the scene, 5,000 men in the most northern part of, uh, uh, of, of the city, marching down along the Sea of Galilee. By the time they leave Galilee, the number has doubled. Right? They're halfway to Jerusalem, and the number has tripled. Right? They, they, as they approach the, the, the Jerusalem gates, as they arrive, the number is now fully formed Roman legion of four fully formed Roman legions, 20,000 people. And now the whole city, the whole country as can rally around them for this moment. This is the moment that we've been waiting for. This guy is going to deliver us from the hand and the oppression of the Romans, right? This is what the, all the foreshadowing was about. Certainly, certainly he's going to do it. This is our prayers are going to be answered. Finally, he's come to deliver us. But Jesus knew, this is important, don't miss this. Jesus knew their motive. And he would eventually lead them through the Jerusalem gates through this Passover, but it wasn't what they intended. It was a Passover to his death. It wasn't to conquer Rome, but it was to conquer sin. And Jesus knew their motive and it had very little to do with who he is and very much to do with what they could get from him because they wanted something. And so Jesus knowing, he withdrew himself again to a mountain 
by himself and he gathers his disciples. He gets them into a boat and he says, here, 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 get into the boat, get into the boat, all 12 disciples, get into the boat. And he sends them to the other side. He's like, look, look, I know what you're thinking. I, I know what you're thinking. Okay, stop, get those thoughts out of your head. Okay, I know what you're thinking. No, 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 no. Get in the boat and, and, and row to the other side of the sea and I'll meet you on the other side and we'll reconvene. And so he, he sends his disciples, dismisses the crowd and he withdraws himself to pray. And so Jesus prays and eventually he uh, reconvenes and regathers with his disciples. And, and he gets to the other side of the lake and he reconnects with them. And he's thinking to himself, finally, right? Finally, I just get to be with my, by myself, with my guys. Like, I get some space. But before he can even finish his sentence, <laughs> once again, the crowd gathers. And the crowd has grown, perhaps, in size. But little do they know that Jesus is about to thin the crowd He's about to call them out. Here's what I mean by that. Have you ever um, maybe heard someone say uh, these words? Man, I gave up on faith because I wasn't getting anything out of it. right? Or I gave up on church because I wasn't getting anything out of it. Or I gave up on so-and-so because I wasn't giving something out of it. right? I, I, I used to do that, but then I wasn't. I used to you know, serve. I used to be faithful. I used to... I used to give, but I wasn't giving anything out of it, right? And what Jesus' point he's about to make is, as long as it's about us getting something out of an it, then we don't still understand it, right? As long as it's about getting something out of it, then we really don't understand what it is all about. As long as we're trying to get something out of it, we're still like children that's racing to the door, right? What are you going to give me? What am I going to get? How can I get it? And so when they found him on the other side, John says, of the lake, they asked him, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus cuts it, he just cuts, he just gets straight to the point, or straight to their point. He says, you're not, come on, come on, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not interested in, 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 in how I got here. You're not at least bit interested in, in, in how even I got here or whoever I, I am, you're not, you're not interested. Come on, come on, come on. And he says, you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate and the loaves and you had, and now you're filled. He says, in other words, you're here for the food, right? It kind of awkward. Like, oh, like, you got us, Jesus. Like, hey, you're here for the food, right? You missed the point of the sign, right? You thought the point of the sign was the food. No, no, no. The point of the sign was to point you to somebody who is here to give you something beyond your appetite, something that will satisfy you, not just here and now. That's beyond your appetite. You missed the point. And then he says to them, and he says to me, and he says to you, he says this, do not work for, in other words, do not, do not live for, don't give your entire life to, don't only think about, don't waste your hours of the day, the days of your life, the years, the years of your life. Don't simply work for food that spoils, but for food that endures into eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus says, come on, come on, come on. Don't you realize what I'm offering you? Don't you realize that he'll send the next verse that God certified me to give you? Don't you realize who I am that's standing in front of you? Don't you realize what I'm trying to give you? This is beyond your appetites. This is beyond me. This is beyond you. This is a revolution. This is something that's big, bigger than Rome, bigger than conquering this city. This is something that will change the world. This is something that he could have said that will still be talked about for 2,000 years. And all you can think about is lunch. So they asked him, they said, what sign then? Okay, Jesus, what sign then will you give? That way we may, we may see it and believe you. What else, what else will you do? Okay, okay, we're starting to get it. We're starting to get it. But come on, just, just one more trick, Jesus. Just do, just do one more magic trick. Just come on, come on. One more sign. And we're going to talk about this next week, so don't miss next week a little bit more in detail. But it's like when we say, I would believe in God if only he would, right? I would believe, I, I got this thing going on, and man, if God would, then I would believe, right? And we'll talk about this next week, so don't miss next week. But 
right? And they, they're, they're saying, this is what they're saying. They're saying, look, if, if you would kind of just do one more trick for us, Jesus. Oh, oh, actually, actually, I have a good idea. It just popped into our heads, okay? Uh, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. And Jesus is like, okay, come on. We're back to lunch. I mean, come on, we can't get past this. Like, come on. Like, don't you realize I'm trying to offer you something? Speaking about, about lunch, uh, about two years ago, uh, uh, before moving out to the Bay Area to start this church, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, meet a man in Las Vegas named uh, Judd Wilhoy. I think it's German or something like that. But uh, Pastor Judd is a pastor in uh, uh, Las Vegas. And uh, man, he is one of the most influential leaders in Las Vegas, right? I mean, uh, this guy has uh, uh, pastors a church of central churches, over 20,000 plus people. I mean, they started multiple campuses all over Las Vegas. I mean, this guy is a great father. He's a great husband. He's a great leader. He's a great entrepreneur. I mean, this man, he's just a phenomenal influential person in Las Vegas. I mean, everybody knows who central church is and who Judd uh, is. And so I got to have lunch with him before we moved out here to start this church. And I remember having lunch with, with Judd, Pastor Judd, and I sat from him, across from him, and we talked and uh, we had conversation and then um, uh, Judd kind of popped the big question. He looked at me and he said, Akeem, what can I do for you? And I'm thinking, man, here's this guy that I'm getting ready to start this church and surely have aspirations to see what you've been able to see here in Las Vegas, to see that echoed in the Bay Area. And I'm sitting here from this guy and, and he says, hey, what can I do for you? He has influence with people all around the world, all around the country in the Bay. He has influence with people in the Bay Area. I mean, who, this guy's his large following, large influence. And he pops the question and says, hey, with all these resources, he says, hey, what can I do for you? And you know what I said? I said, hey, can you um, actually, can you, can, you, can you give me, you know, like, you know, like $100,000? No, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> Right? I didn't say that. But, hint, by the way, for, for those of you watching, hint. You know what you ask someone with influence, right? D do you know what you ask people that's of importance? You ask questions. You don't ask for stuff, right? Because that would be considered rude. You don't ask for stuff. No, no. When you're with someone of significance, of importance, it, this is an opportunity for you to lean in, for you to learn in such a way that you've never learned before, right? This is for you to kind of lean in and gain some wisdom and knowledge from them. You don't ask for stuff. You ask questions. And what's interesting is that, and I will be done in just a moment, these men and women in the scriptures are standing on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, right? And they're standing in the presence of the light of the world. God in a bod, God in a body, God personified. And all they can think about is their appetite. They couldn't get past their stomachs. And in fact, if you read the rest of John 6, which I would encourage you to do, many, John says, many decided to unfollow Jesus, to unsubscribe, to unfriend Jesus. Because once they realized the magic show was over, they lost all interest in the magician. Once they realized they got everything they wanted, everything they could get from him, right? They realized that they had everything they could get. They said, okay, I'm done. I'm just gonna walk away. And maybe in their circumstance, they have an excuse but you don't and I don't and we don't because we are standing on the other side of the resurrection. We get to look back at the story and we see that John, his faith, what he saw, what he heard, what he experienced, he documented for us and as a result, He's encouraging us, hey, you should believe based upon what I saw and heard. And I'm telling you, I gazed into the eyes of the Messiah, into God in flesh, God in a body, God personified. I stared into his eyes and now I'm writing and documenting my experience so that you too would believe in him. And so I wanna pop the big question for you and say, how about you? I want to pop the big question to you and say, and say, are we just in this for the food? 
are we just in this for the food? Are, are, are we just in this, in this Christian thing to see what we can get out of it? Are we just following just so that we could uh, get out of him? Because God wants to offer you something that's beyond temporary satisfaction, temporary, uh, your appetite, something that not just will satisfy you now, but something that gives you a peace that transcends all understanding into the future, but not just the future, but something that starts now that echoes into eternity. It's a relationship with him that's authentic because here's the thing, you cannot experience an authentic relationship with somebody if you're always trying to get something from them. And God says, I'm trying to give you something that's real, that you can experience now and that will last forever, where you can be a part of, that your resources not just stretch into now, but it could stretch into forever, that your your faith that could just impact not just now, but stretch into for, to forever. Your faith, your resources, your relationships, things that you're involved in, that you're making a difference in, that it could touch not just now, but impact forever. Look, I'm offering you something that will echo into eternity. So are we just in this for the food or that will make a difference for eternity? And so I wanna encourage you to step into a relationship with this person, Jesus, that's changed my life. And I hope and believe that it will change your life because it changed John's life. And John says, hey, it did for me and I hope it'll be the same for you. So follow, so subscribe. So friend of request, let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for Jesus and for what he means and represents to thousands of people all across the, the world, the books that have been sold, bestseller. And God, I pray for my friends um, that maybe are questioning their faith, maybe have yet to step into a relationship with Jesus. And they're like these people that are waiting. They want one more magic trick, one more sign. God, I pray that you would speak life into them and that these words, would mean something that would just last, not just here, but into eternity. They would receive the life of Jesus into their hearts. And I pray this in your son's name. Amen. Hey, we'll see you next week for part five. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be good uh, for next week. in Jesus, the rabbi from Nazareth. Love you. And we'll see you uh, this week at Storyline. Thank you, Pastor Akeem, for such a powerful message. That was wonderful. We also want to say thank you to all of you that generously give to Storyline. Because of your generosity, we're able to continue to spread the message of Jesus. And if you're a member at Storyline, we would love to invite you to give online. We at Storyline, one of our core values is that we believe in rational generosity. And with that, we mean that we truly believe truly giving is truly having. So the best way for you to give is online on our website at thisisstoryline.com. All right, if at any point during that message you just heard, you heard a term, some verbiage, or an example of something that didn't resonate, it didn't, it didn't mean anything to you, like you didn't know what it meant, that's what Alpha Life Group is for. It's a safe space for you to ask those questions of who is so and so, what does so and such and such mean, why did this happen in the Bible? Alpha Life Group, go ahead and type in on the connect card, Alpha Life Group, and we'll get you connected. And again, we just wanted to say thank you for tuning in this week. Uh, th that was week number four. So next week is week number five of Jesus, the rabbi from Nazareth. Looking forward to seeing you virtually soon. All right.